Um, for the, those uh, liturgical music ministers, my name is Megan Shepard. I'm the Associate Director of Notre Dame Vision. Um, and just, I don't have my bell with me, CYMs, but I'll do the keys as an equivalent. I've been ringing a little bell instead of like trying to call for attention with this, um, the CYMs. So we've had two, um, it's like right at eye height. It's, I'll just talk very loudly. Yeah. <laughs> so we've had two parallel tracks this week with the campus and youth ministers diving deeply into a scriptural immersion in the morning and a narrative illumination, storytelling that helps us see the themes of scripture and the stories of scripture in a new way in the afternoons. And the liturgical music ministers, you've been exposed to rich and reflection and theological insights and beautiful song. And together we joined for the musicals, um, which you know, was just such a treat. And I know Carolyn just got recognized for them, but for the CYMs who might not have been able to see, this is the, um, Carolyn Pirtle is the Associate Director of the Center for Liturgy. She's coordinating the LMM conference and also is the composer of our musicals and a very dear friend. So just so you can see. Uh, it's just very clearly. And because we also have um, someone else from the McGrath Institute for Church Life here, I just would like, Esther, do you want to introduce yourself real briefly? Sure. Hi, my name is Esther Terry. I'm the program director of Camino, which if you've heard of the STEP program of online theology courses in English, the Camino is online theology courses in Spanish. If any of you have questions about adult faith formation online, I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you. So again, this is as part of our efforts, particularly this summer as we move into this new kind of reality as a McGrath Institute is really these programs are overlapping and nourishing one another. So now as we get to come to this point in the afternoon, nourished by hopefully some snacks, some energy, we will be nourished by the incredible giftedness of Sarah Hart, who I had the, the pleasure of, I only heard the beginning of the session last week because I had to go over to the high school students for something, but even just that taste has me eagerly anticipating the guidance that is to come as we explore how the word that we sing, that we speak, comes in flesh in our lives through song and through life. So I invite Sarah up to, to guide us through a beautiful afternoon. Are you tired? Just turn to someone and say, stop being so tired. Just say it. I know. You're making me tired. I know. This is like, I was just saying, this is like the worst time of day to give a presentation because this is my napping time. So this is very hard to give a presentation. All right. Well, I'm very, very happy to be with you. Um, my name is Sarah Hart. And um, where are my liturgical music people? Raise your hands. Oh, good. That's so awesome. Um, have any of you ever sung any Sarah Hart music? Oh, okay, good. A few. Whew, thank God. Okay. Um, I'm very glad about that. But I work primarily with Oregon Catholic Press in Portland, Oregon. Um, I also am a CCM songwriter, which means I write a lot for Christian artists that you might hear on the radio kind of stuff. So I've kind of got one foot in both worlds in terms of the way I use words in my ministry. Um, but today, what I really want to do is just have some fun with you and share with you and sing with you and pray with you. One liturgical minister to another, one tired mom to another person. Um, so words spoken and lived. And um, I think what we're going to do first is, oh, let's see. What can we do first? Um, okay, I'm going to start that in D. Yes. Everybody go, la, let me sing that note. Oh. Okay, so somebody take la and somebody take la. And let's put that together. Here we go. La. Beautiful. Okay, do we think we can break it into thirds? Are we feeling that daring? <gasps> All right, you guys take the melody. You take the middle. You guys take the, the high. La. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. I'm going to point you in. La, la, la. Okay, the kids are were way better than you. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. Um, okay, so we're going to begin um, by singing because... 
Singing is praying twice, and singing does this miraculous thing. It opens our lungs, it opens our hearts, it opens our voices, and it completely changes our posture as well. And speaking of completely changing our posture, let's all stand up while we sing today. Um, that is the best way to do it. Um, if you know this song, I'm so glad. Please sing it. If you do not know this song, you have been living under a rock, my friend. You should know this song. This is a great, great song um, written by a friend of mine, and it is beautiful. And I think there's no better way to give thanks to God with our worship and song than to say, bless him. Let my soul bless him. Let my soul proclaim. So let's jump right in and sing this beautiful refrain. Here we go. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like that. Beautiful. So we're going to sing The Sun Comes Up. Here we go. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Oh, let's sing together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. And sing, sing like that. of applause for the church. Amen. So turn to someone really quick, stay standing, and just say, your voice does not suck. Go, tell them. Tell them that. It's important for us to hear <laughs> that your voice does not suck. It's the way we all get along, right? Okay. So I would love to do a little exercise. Um, actually, we're going to do something totally different. I believe fully in movement. Now, I know it's not always appropriate, but we are not at Mass. So, girlfriend, look at you. Get up here. Come on. Come on. Come up here. All right. She's going to do it. Look at you. You're like superstar. Okay. Come on up here.
Yes, come with me, and we're gonna we're gonna um, have you. Anybody else want to join? I don't even know your name. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. What a great name. Do you know what Sarah means? You do, right? <coughs> means God's princess. <coughs> Just saying. Okay. Uh, you can stay right there if you would like to. Okay, somebody come join Sarah because it's really good to have a friend with you. All right, great, awesome. And what's your name? Sam. What is it, Sam? Sarah and Sam. It's the, it's the Sam and Sarah show. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to sing. Okay, I'm not going to do that to you. All right, so we're going to do a little movement. Um, I take yoga classes, and it's really, really awesome, and it has changed my way of breathing and being. So everybody take a deep breath. Let it go. Reach your hands up. Put it over your head. This changes your singing posture, I swear, because it's like it opens your chest, right? Okay, put it down in front of you. Namaste in bed. Okay, so, um, yes, I'd rather stay in bed. All right. <laughs> she just got it, folks. She just got it. All right. So anyway, we changed our breathing posture a little bit. So now we're going to change our motion posture. And I'm going to teach you a new song. Um, I wrote this with my friend Valimar Jansen, and we do motions for it. So let me show it to you. good. Okay, you should feel both. All right, so here we go. Let's try it again. God is with me. God is with you. God is with us. You can't walk and chew gum, can you? Okay, God bless you. We pray for you. Okay, um, so, and... <laughs> We, we believe in you. We believe you'll get it. So when you put it together, here's how it looks. And Sarah and Sam are so eloquently going to demonstrate. Um, the first part, I will sing a line, then you sing the same line. The back half, we're going to sing it together. Um, so I sing, God is with me. And then you sing it. God is with you. God is with us. In this place. Now here's where you got to get tricky because I'll sing it, but you just do the motions for now. Before and behind, below and within, above and around, God is with us. Let's try and sing it and do it. Before and behind, below and within, Above and around, God is with us. The angels are weeping. For joy, I mean, for joy. You're doing so well. Okay, so when we put it all together, let's try it one more time. Remember, the first time I'm going to sing, then you respond, and then we all sing together the back half, okay? I believe in you. I believe in you. Before I even go on, by the way, ladies, I have to tell you something. Every single man in this room was participating. Could you please give them a round of applause? As it is hard for the guys to participate sometimes. All right. All right. Here we go. Let's try it together. God is with me. God is with you. God is with us in this place. Before and behind, below and within, above and around, God is with us. Oh, that was so beautiful. Okay, so a lot can change with just a word. So we're going to change that word to peace. Peace is with me. Peace is with you. Peace is with us in this place before and behind below and within above and around peace is with 
with us. Oh, it's looking so beautiful from here. I cannot even tell you. We're going to do one more word, and that word is going to be hope. Let's sing hope. Hope is with me. Hope is with you. Oh, hope is with us in this place. Before and behind, below and within, above and around, hope is with us. All right. So last time, what is your name? You. What is it? Maurice, come up here and stand up and show everybody how well you do this. Okay, because Maurice, you are the bravest man I've seen all day. Come here, just stand. I know, that's why you're up here. You know how like when you get called out in class for being bad? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so Maurice is going to lead us out with Sarah and Sam, and we are going to sing God is with me again. Are you ready? One more time, friends. Let's try it. God is with me. God is with you. Beautiful. God is with us in this place. Before and behind, below and within, above and around, God is with us. So beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. And on the way down, just reach out and hug your neighbor and say, I love you, neighbor. <laughs> All right, you can sit down. So <laughs> So now I know sometimes adults feel a little odd doing that, right? Because like we even feel odd like when we're, we are at mass, you know, and uh, Father says, the Lord be with you. And you're like, and with your spirit? Like, should I move my hands or should I not? You know, and I'm always just like, and with your spirit. And people around me are going, I'm walking away. Okay. So, but I know motion does not always feel easy, but I tell you, if any of you work with kids, especially, teach them that kind of song. Teach them motion. For kids, especially, when you add music, word, and motion, it sticks in their hearts. Who doesn't remember? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? He climbed up. At, see, like you're automatically doing it. So I'm here to tell you that words, and you may feel silly doing it, but for especially our young people, that can kind of change their perspective. How many of you in here work with kids, by the way? Okay. How many? Of, that's a lot. How many of you work with youth? All right. How, meaning like youth, young adult. How many of you work in adult catechesis? Okay, awesome. That's great. And how many of you um, are in business administration or run the office or anything like that? <gasps> round of applause for the money people, please. They make the world go round. Okay. And uh, what did I miss? W tell me some other things that you all do in this room. Did I miss anybody? Adult choir. Adult choir? Oh, yeah. How many musicians? Duh. Okay. Yeah. All right. What else? Coach, you're a coach. Wait, let me guess. Baseball. Oh, track. Oh, I don't know then. Wrestling. I only know two sports, so I, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so um, I want to do a couple things today. It maybe will help illustrate. Um, oh, listen to that. That helps to illustrate my sort of growth, too, as a musician in the church. And I want to say this before I tell you any stories today. One thing I love about being Catholic is that we have literally been around for 2,000 years. And what that means is that we have 2,000 years of music history and word history in the church. Now, as a musician, there are some very interesting arguments out there. That old stuff doesn't belong in our contemporary church. Or that contemporary stuff doesn't belong in our Latin mass. Or that whatever doesn't belong with our whatever, right? Or if we sing, here I am one more time, I'm going to kill someone. You know, like, <laughs> so these are the things that we hear. But here's what I'm here to tell you before I tell you any story. There is room in our church for all of it. My Aunt Marcy 
still goes to Latin Mass with lace on her head, and the priest turned around. There is room for that. I myself prefer an electric guitar. There is room for that. I know people that like chant. There is room for that. So we can't ever, especially the musicians in this room, I'm talking to you, we can't ever go into any service with judgment and preconceived notions about the way people are receiving worship and the word in their hearts. Because just as varying as our music is, our way of communicating with them and the way that they're going to receive God, it is different for everyone. We all have our personal taste. Five of us could walk up to Van Gogh's Starry Night and say, that is the ugliest painting I've ever seen. And the rest of us would go, oh my gosh. And I would be standing there crying, which I actually have done in front of a Van Gogh painting, lost control and started weeping. Because it is very... Um, much about our personal taste. However, when it comes to the body of Christ and worship, our personal taste has to go away and recognizing that everybody belongs. And we are trying to do something very difficult, which is make everybody happy, which my mama said you never, never will do. So if you're struggling with this in your church, let that be your first rule. You know you're not going to make everybody happy. But do your best to choose things that will minister all across the board. That being said, I want to tell you this story, and it has to do with this organ. So I grew up in a, um, in a little farm church in Lancaster, Ohio. Is anybody here from Ohio? Yay! Where are y'all from? Cleveland, Cleveland. Akron. You're all from the northern part. Well, I'm from the pretty part. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm from southeastern Ohio, the hillbilly country, the hills, and uh, really close to West Virginia, and prettiest, most beautiful place. And I, I uh, grew up in a very small kind of country church where everybody knew everybody, which was a good and bad thing, if you know what I mean. Um, now, my family was very musical. I, I tell people all the time that growing up in my house was like growing up inside of The Sound of Music, because I would wake up in the morning, and my mom would be like, good morning, good morning. It's time to get your ass out of bed. You know, that would be my mom. And I'd be like, good morning. I hate you. You know, and that's kind of how it went. But somebody was always singing a song in my house or making up songs or just, you know, using music to communicate. I literally, every Saturday night, almost every Saturday night, my mom would haul my sister and I to wherever the bluegrass music was happening. And we would take spoons and washboards and guitars and our voices and whatever we had to offer. And we would sing. That is how I grew up. And so music was a huge part of who I was and today a part of who I am. When I went to church on Sunday to the 10 o'clock service, there was sweet, dear, lovely Mrs. Kerfuffle, who was probably 189 years old. And she, I think, had been at the parish for 100 of those years as the organist. And she knew two songs, which she played very poorly. But she played, and it would sound like this. Please stand. <laughs> Holy God, we praise thy name. <laughs> okay, so that is my eight-year-old music music life, right? Okay. And so you can see why as a young person, I say this too, if you work with kids or young people, for me, there was this giant disconnect because as soon as I would hear, you know, I, I would get up in the morning and my family singing and everybody happy and lively and dancing around the house. And I would go to church and I would hear that and I would go, God hates me. Like I, it was such a disconnect in my life. And it really, it was. It was just like this crazy disconnect. And then one Sunday, I walked in. Now, my family had what we lovingly called the Hart Family Pew because there were a lot of us. So we would walk in, and everybody knows, don't sit there. That's the Hart Family Pew. And they all sing really loud. So it would be like my family and nobody around us and everybody on the other side of the church because they were embarrassed by how loud we all sang, right? So, I mean, I would still, even if Mrs. Kerfeffel, holy God, my heart was in it, you know. It wasn't like my heart wasn't there. Um, <laughs> holy God, are we singing this again? Okay. Um, but we would. And so I walk in this one Sunday, this one particular Sunday, and there was a new little brochure booklet on the end of the pew. 
And I'm sure that some of you are the age that I am, 29 or so. And, um, and I picked up this book. And I, because I was such an avid reader as a kid, too, I love to read. So I pick up this book, and I'm leafing through it. And I'm going to just give you some of the memories about the lyrics I read. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of mercy, the God who saves. I shall not fear the dark of night nor the arrow that flies by day. That rhymes. Leaf through. What is this? He will raise me up on eagle's wings? That's cool. Bear me on the breath of dawn? What? Flip through a little more. Be not afraid. An eight-year-old kid reading those words. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come follow me and I'll give you rest. And I'm showing my mom and I'm going, Mom, look at these awesome words. Look at these cool words, right? My mom's like, yeah, those are, those are cool words. They're beautiful. And um, I look up, and I see on the altar three women walk out. Okay, first of all, there were women on the altar. All right? What is happening? Second, they all were holding guitars. And I leaned over, and I said to my mom, Mommy, are they going to get arrested? <laughs> and she's like, I don't think so. I think they're here to play music. So sure enough, one of them was Mrs. Griggs, my friend Jenny, who I went to school with, her mom. And Mrs. Griggs said, hello, we would like to invite you to please pick up the new book that is at the end of your pew. Does anybody remember what that book was called? Glory and Praise. All right, there it is. And it had that, it was like ugly orange with bubbly letters and it had a weird sunset, you know. It was so 70s, but, but there it was. All right, and so... Um, so she, I remember this. This is what I remember. Mrs. Griggs said, um, <laughs> she didn't say that. Okay. She said, from now on, this mass will be the contemporary mass. Father has asked the three of us to come with our guitars on Sunday to teach you at least two new songs for a few months until we have learned about half of this book. And from now on, we will be singing these songs at this Mass. If you do not like what you hear today, please join us for another Mass. Man, was that so inviting? No, is that so lovely to say it that way? That we recognize some of you might not like what's about to happen here. We invite you to any other one of the, three, the four Masses please. But if you like this, please stay with us, right? So I just have to play for you the very first thing I remember. She said, this is what we're going to teach you today. Would you open your book to blah, 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 whatever it was. And here's what happened. And I know you will all join with me. It sounded like this. Sing to the mountains, sing to the sea. Raise your voices, lift your hearts. This is the day the Lord has made. Let all the earth rejoice. I also call it the Catholic drinking song because you just want to do this. So you, you know, <laughs> sing to the mountains, drink to the sea, like you just do. Um, so... <laughs> Still, I just, that memory is burned in my heart because I thought to myself, oh, Jesus likes me. He wants me to be happy in church. He wants me to use my voice. He wants me to use my gift of song. I understand syncopation, you know, like I can sing this melody. I love these words. Okay, just get the melody out of your mind for a second. Think about the words. I will give thanks to you, my God. You have answered my plea. You have saved my soul from death. You are my strength and my song. Sing to the mountains. Sing to the sea. Not sing to the mountains, but sing. Sing to the seas. Raise your voices. Lift your hearts. This is the ding-dong day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, right? Let all the earth rejoice. Those were great words for me to be singing. Now, so from then on, of course, I went to the contemporary mass and went on to learn to play the guitar immediately. I walked out of the church that day. I was in second grade, and I remember holding my mom's hand on the way out of the church, and we had been studying vocation. And my mom loves to tell this story. We'd been studying vocations because I was, you know, uh, getting ready for communion and all that. And I looked at my mom, and I said, Mom, I know what my vocation is. She's like, what's your vocation? And I said, I am going to be a rock star. That is what I said to my mom. Like, I just knew it. As soon as I walked out, I'm like, if you, if this music can be in church, I want to live a life where I can do this music in church. That's what I want to do. 
eight years old, right? So the reason I bring up that story to you is to say this. Never underestimate the impact of music and word to your congregation. For every time that you look out in a crowd and you see somebody falling asleep and you focus on that, because that's what we do as humans, we feel bad that somebody fell asleep. Instead of focusing on that, remember that there's probably one little kid who's like looking at you in awe, thinking that you are the best musician he's ever heard and that they want to grow up and play music in church too. Or at the very least, sing. At the very least, give God their worship. Never underestimate the power of that, especially to my music friends. Uh, as a writer, I do not take one note, one word lightly. I put 110% of love and heart into every single thing I write because I believe that God deserves nothing less. If I'm writing crap, poor God. <laughs> I want to write good stuff for God. Anyway, but what that brings me to is this, because I have a new appreciation now. And where I sang this song, ad infinitum, right? Odd infinitum, till I was blue in the face, I never appreciated it. Until all these years later, and all this contemporary music later, and I sang this in church about two years ago, and all of a sudden, it was new. And that's another reason we need great new expressions and great new words, to make the old new. We are not out to ever erase what is old. We are out to Bring back what is old, what is traditional, what is our faith, and make it new again and repurpose and reuse because it is our history. It is so important to the church. However, if you're a contemporary musician like me, you want to make it look different, right? That's what you want to do. So I thought we could sing this together. Let's try it. Holy God, we praise thy name. Wait, Lord of all, we bow before thee. All on earth thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee. Infinite thy vast domain. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead because the reason I skip ahead is that I know no one who has sung this verse. This song was written in 1771. 1771. And the first time I read this verse, I'm like, why are we not singing this? Why are we as Catholic Christian people not singing this? This is our prayer, Right? And we should be singing this in church. And I'm so dang mad at the hymnal people because they should put this one back in. But it won't keep me from singing it today with you. So as we sing it, here's my challenge to you. Think about what the words actually are saying. We don't sing just with our lips. We sing with our hearts and our minds connected. It's all connected. We have so many snares. Ugh. Keep us, Lord, safe and without sin. Let us not be confused by this world. It's a darn confusing place, but we put our trust in you. So let's sing this together. Spare thy people, Lord, we pray. By a thousand snares surrounded. Keep us without sin today. Never let us be confounded. Oh, I put my trust in Trust in thee, never 
if you did not know that song and Chris Tomlin were singing it on stage, you would think these lyrics are brand new. This is what's beautiful about our music history and our church history. The word made new. Turn to someone and say, my friend, I see Jesus in you. Turn to someone else and say, I see Jesus in you too. Now turn to someone and say, I don't know if I see Jesus in you, but I'm sure you're working on it. I just want to talk a little bit about the word. Um, before I do this, this is one of my favorite quotes. The Holy Scriptures are our letters from home. Is that so beautiful? Actually, I wish he had added the word love. I, they are our love letters from home. They are God's love letters to us. And if you're ever feeling far or distant in your relationship with the Lord, y'all, I'm going to smack you over the head with the Bible. Just pick it up. Pick it up and open the book. I guarantee you that within seconds you will read a word and it will shoot straight to your heart and you will remember, oh, yeah, that's right. God actually likes me. Um, so I want to just tell you because I feel like I want to tell this story. I just had the most beautiful experience. My uncle um, Frank, my uncle Frank, he was a priest, Father Frank. I always called him Father Frank, even though he was my uncle. But if your uncle's a priest, like you can't call him, hey, Uncle Frank, you know, like you just can't. So I always called him Father Frank. But when he passed away, I was a teenager. I was 17. And I helped, he was a priest in the Steubenville Diocese. And I helped my family clean out his apartment. Um, and he was such a, he was a writer for the newspaper, but he was also a book writer. And he was very much a social justice priest, and he wrote on every issue in the world. He wrote, his heart was like the poor in Appalachia, um, the importance of women to the church and how overlooked they were. He, he wrote endlessly on civil rights, and he went down um, to march with Dr. King in Selma. So he was like just an amazing, cool priest. And all, when I was a teenager, we were going through his apartment, you know, he just had so much paper, so many words, right? Here it is, so many words. And I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta get rid of this stuff. And my aunt's like, nope, load it in my car. I'm gonna figure out what to do with it. So she lovingly went through it and all of his work is archived here at the library. So I went to the library this afternoon and took out his letters and papers and photographs and his handwriting and I held it in my hands and I saw his photographs and um, I even found my great-grandparents' marriage certificate, which I'm like, I don't think this is supposed to be in here. But <laughs> well, I think I better tell my aunt, and she, we need to get that back. But it was so beautiful to hold those things and to feel like I got another visit from my uncle. Um, words and writing them down are important. Um, and I, I feel so strongly that the, I, I'm so grateful for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And I'm so grateful for, um, you know, David the psalmist. And I'm so grateful for the writers of the Torah, whoever they were. Um, because these people recorded the word of God for us and God's love for us. So I want to talk just a little bit about the word. Um, the way I really want to approach it is actually, um, I want to I talk a little bit about this girl because she's one of my favorites. This is what I look like when I'm singing, but... One way we speak the word of God in worship and song, and we've been doing that this morning. But this is what I really want to tell you the story of. This is um, a story that you know very well. This is Mary, and this is um, the visitation from the angel Thor, evidently. And, um, <laughs> and so, so the angel Thor comes to Mary, and he says, hey, Mary, guess what? God has a surprise for you. And she's like, really? What's the surprise? Is it money? Because I'm very poor. And the angel says, no, it's better. It's a baby. What? No. So the angel says, yes, you will have a baby out of all of the women in the world that have ever lived or that ever will. Think about that for a minute. God has chosen you, and this time, and you shall have a son, and his name will be Jesus. He will be the word made flesh. The word made flesh. 
And Mary's like, say what? Look at the look on her face. That's what she's doing. And he's like, I promise you, Iron Man's right behind me. You want to ask him too? Anyway. Um, and so God, God gives her a choice, however. She gets a choice. And she says one word. What is her word? Yes. That is her word. Yes. And just say it again. Say the word yes. Okay, great. Now, I want you to say it as loud as you can and listen to it echo in here. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Yes! Okay, you hear how that sort of echoed through the room? That is Mary's yes. It is still in this day and age echoing in our hearts. Her yes echoes throughout eternity. The word made flesh in Mary. And so she got the choice. She said yes. And the word was made flesh. And because of Mary, we have Jesus. And so then the angel Thor tells her, and I can't call him anything else now because that's what he looks like. And he tells her this. He says, hey, by the way, did you know um, that uh, your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant as well? Old woman that she is. Well, that's just a mean-ass angel. Why did he have to bring up the age thing? I don't know. But he said, you know, she, this is evidently, I don't know, like one of God's greatest miracles all through scripture is impregnating elderly women. Just read your Bible. It's true over and over and over. I don't know what it's all about, but it's just, it's there in black and white. Okay. So anyway, he says this to her and she's like, what? Oh my gosh. Really? Elizabeth? Oh my gosh. I want to go see her. I need to go tell her. I love her and congratulations. That's all Mary can think about, right? So she runs, she runs and gets on a camel and rides across the desert in her first trimester of pregnancy, gets to Elizabeth's house, gets off the camel, throws up, and then goes (laughs) and knocks on the door. And Elizabeth opens the door and runs out. And she says, Mary, Mary. This is an incredible transaction between these two women, this interaction. She says this, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come visit me? Before you even got within a thousand feet of me, the baby in my womb leapt, skipped like a lamb for sheer joy. Blessed woman of God who believed Every word that God said, there it is again, who believed every word. And you know what Mary did? She said, I know, I'm so awesome. No, she did not say that. She said, I know, right? Kind of that is what she said. How did it get to be me? Look at me. God took a look at me and he said, you're the most fortunate woman on earth. And then it says, and this is the part we always miss, Her soul sang exuberantly. It doesn't say she was like, yay, God is so awesome and I'm pregnant. She said, my soul rejoices. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. What's been done for me will never be forgotten. But she didn't just say it. She sang it. I believe with all my heart that she sang it. My soul rejoices. My soul rejoices. And my spirit glorifies my Savior. Mary, this girl sucks compared to you. Okay. Mary sang. Do y'all even know who this is? Yeah, I don't either. Okay. um, (laughs) But Mary sang. Sang. It is the first example we have of the word made flesh and worshiping in song right? It's incredible. We also have, however, this amazing guy who, for whatever reason, in this picture looks so depressed. I I think it's because he's like, oh man, I wanted an electric guitar. They gave me an auto harp. Like, he just looks so depressed. And he's wearing just these ugly red socks. I don't know what that's all about. He's just so sad. But here's the truth about David, about King David. All right. If you are, you know, as Catholics, um, that we do this every week. We sing the words of this particular person every 
single week. Talk about knowing the word in worship. Holy cow, David was the master of it. But here's what I want to tell you about David in studying his psalms tremendously in my own life and in studying about him. I believe with all of my heart that David was a complete manic depressive. I really believe this because if you know anything about his psalms, you'll have one psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous deeds. And then the next, very next one will be. I suck so bad I can't believe it. I mean, really, that's like the Psalms of David. It's just like a roller coaster of his relationship with God. But you cannot say this about him. He was, you cannot say that he wasn't honest. Because there's never been more honesty in the word of God than in the Psalms, which is why we have which is why they've been chosen for us to sing every Sunday. Because what David paints for us is a picture of what it means to be human. To be human and to be struggling for faith. And to be trying so hard to please God and love God and serve God in the midst of this mess that is called the flesh. That's why the Psalms are sung every Sunday. That is why we proclaim them. Now, how many people in here do I have who are canters? Um, oh, I got some canters. All right. So I need one brave canter who is willing to come up and sing with me. <laughs> You're actually sinking in your seat. All right. You want to do it? Come on up here. All right. Get round of applause for this canter. Okay. You're going to stand here at this microphone. Now, um, yeah, stand at that microphone there. What's your name? Richard. Richard. Everybody say hello, Richard. Richard, where are you from? Los Angeles. <gasps> are you going to be at Congress? Mm -hmm. LA uh, Congress? Uh, perhaps. We'll see. Oh, come to Congress. Have you ever been before? Uh, sort of. How many of you have been to LA Congress? Yeah, if you haven't been there, shame on you. It is like Catholic it's Disneyland. It's Disney. so awesome. Well, it actually is in Anaheim. It is in Disneyland, yeah, to tell you the truth. So it's a Not beautiful gathering. LA, it, you know what I love about Congress is there's something for everyone. There is something for the way most like liberal thinker and the way most conservative thinker. And there's a workshop for every different belief system and political system and, and race and everything. And then you all come together for mass. It's the holiest thing, I swear. It's the most beautiful thing. OK, all that aside, Richard, you're going to sing with me. Are you ready? Let's see. Um, that's probably a really bad key. Can you sing there? The Lord is my shepherd. Can you sing that? The Lord is my shepherd. Great. Okay, round of applause for him. He's so brave. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to sing it. Um, I'll sing two lines, and I'll teach them to you. Okay. And then I'll sing the back two lines and teach them to you. Okay, can and then we'll this line? Yeah, Anywhere you want to. And then we'll put it all together. Yes. Um, you Look at you looking like a pro. Do you need an electric guitar or anything? No, okay. I don't plug right. in. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> All right, here's how the first two lines are. Oh, before I forget, would you please give that gentleman, his name is Brendan, give him a huge round of applause. He's been doing all the back work this week with sound, and he's amazing. All right. I owe you a cup of coffee or a whiskey, whatever you prefer. I don't care. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Can you sing that? The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Beautiful. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, so let's all sing it, and let's all try to put it together. Can you get closer to the mic, Richard? Yeah. Your voice is beautiful. Don't go hide in it. Okay, here we go, everybody. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Beautiful. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want in verdant pastures he gives me repose beside restful waters he leads me he refreshes my soul the Lord is my 
shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Okay, Richard, I'm going to ask you one favor. When it's time for the refrain, I want you to bring him back in, okay? Yes, okay. But this, like, I don't know. Um, I, both hands. Yes, I would. Oh, well, I think you should do crazy Wait, canter sorry. face, which is more. Because that way everybody knows. Yes. Like, that way everybody knows this is actually you, people. You're singing now. Because I swear I've seen some canters just kind of go. Or sometimes people go, and I'm like, are they picking their nose? What's happening now? So I prefer. Let me see you do it one more time. Crazy canter face. Yeah, sunrise. There you go. Perfect. All right. So, <laughs> so we'll sing that refrain again in a second. I'll sing verse two. Um. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Okay, we're going to sing that refrain one more time, but before we do, I want to tell you this. This Lord is my shepherd came at a very low point in the psalmist's life. Very low. And it's incredible when you think about the words against what was happening to him. The Lord is my shepherd. Still and after all the crap in my life, he's my shepherd. I won't want for anything. What could I need? And that last verse in particular, David, who's going through it all, says, only goodness and kindness will follow me. And I'll dwell in God's house forever. Hope. What beautiful, beautiful words. Again, what the human psalmists painted has become for us the very word of God. Hope. He is our shepherd. Let's sing that refrain one more time together. Just the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Amen. Round of applause for you and for Richard. You're so brave and good. Okay. So um, just for a second, I, I would like to go back for a minute. And I want you to have a few minutes just in your little where you are to have a quick discussion. Um, I want you to talk about with the people around you in what ways you're incorporating worship and song into your ministry, whatever that ministry is, um, and what may have worked well and what may have not. If you're a wrestler, perhaps you're playing We Are the Champions over and over again. So that could be... Celebrate good times. See? Right. Okay. So there's no right or wrong answer here. I got to tell you, Celebrate Good Times is actually an awesome worship song. Right? Like, why not? Why not? One of the most holy songs I've ever heard in my life is The Rebel Jesus by Jackson Brown, who is a complete atheist. It's one of the holiest songs I've ever heard. So, uh, yeah, that and uh, Tom Petty's Last Dance with Mary Jane for some reason. Okay. So let's talk about this. In what ways... <laughs> I just like that song, really. Okay. In what ways am I incorporating worship and song into my ministry? And really tell people here, take a few minutes, what has worked and what's not. It's good for us to share with one another kind of the things that we see working and what doesn't. So you've got a few minutes. Go. Let's talk. Grab a friend.
anyone to talk to. <laughs> okay. Okay, friends, so we're going to move right along, um, and we're going to have probably one more discussion question, but I, I just want to get, get through some of this today. So this is the second um, part of what I was saying about speaking the Word of God. So we talked about how we do it through worship and how we do it through music, um, and just, uh, just how important that is just in the body of Christ and hearing other people and really trying hard to respect everybody and um, recognizing that music is not just for one but for all. Uh, so we work on that. Um, so the second part I want to talk about is we speak the word of God to one another. Just, I just want you to speak the word of God to someone. I want you to turn to, just turn to them and say, um, dang girl, you look good. Go, just tell somebody that. And speak the word of God to them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Now, how in the world, you are asking, is that speaking the word of God? You know how? Because every single one of you smiled, right? You made somebody happy with your words, even if you bald-faced lied to them. You made them happy <laughs> with your words. This is a beautiful thing. This is a good thing. We speak the word in love. How many of you um, just absolutely loved the election this year? Wasn't it great? Wasn't that fun? Okay, no, nobody liked the election this year. Um, I, I want to tell you that I, um, I think I've never felt this part of speaking the word of the Lord so deeply as I felt it in the months of June through November. Um, the reason I say it is, is because um, most people here, I would venture to guess, have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or at the least text. Um, and... I, I really was just appalled, to be quite honest, um, especially one day in particular. I mean, there had been a series of just people saying terrible things. But one day in particular, one of my dear friends, who's another Christian musician, just happened to post something on their page. And I don't agree with them politically, you know. I'm, I'm not, we're not in the same, we don't play for the same political team. Um, I'm not going to tell you what team I play for. Um, but anyway, <laughs> we don't play for the same team. And I, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not a comment I agree with. But I just kind of was like, that's interesting. And then I clicked on the comments. And I wish, I, I'm, I would be embarrassed to even tell you some of the comments. And some of the comments were 
from people I knew. They were so horrible. They were so rude. It was just out and out name calling. It was just ugly. Somebody actually said, you are a jackass for thinking that. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, how in the world is it that social media has done that to us? That it has removed us from people so that if I am on your Facebook page and I disagree with you, I feel like I can post whatever the heck I want. But I would post things that I would never say to your face if I were sitting right here looking at you. It was, it was appalling to me. I just feel like in some ways social media has been a good thing because I keep up with all those, you know, wonderful people that hated me in high school and now like me for some reason. But, you know, but, but it really is a tool for, like, you know, keeping up with people and keeping up with family because I live far from my family. But it also has its real pitfalls. And so in speaking the word of God in the modern world, whether we all like it or not, this is a huge way that we speak the word of God. And especially if you work with young people, this is how they evangelize. This is their world of witness exists in their devices. That is their world of witness. And you will see one of my favorite sites, because I love teenagers. I have teenagers. I have a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old. Pray for me, please. I have two girls. Um, but I, and I love my teenagers, but if you walk into any coffee shop during the summer and there's a gaggle of kids in there, eight kids just hanging out together, they are all on their phones. So they're together, they're in a group because what the human spirit wants is togetherness. We want to be, we're pack animals, but yet we've created this thing that separates us from even talking to the person across from us. It's so weird. And when we do talk to the person across from us, it's often just really ugly and really mean. So I want to paint a little picture for you about the word and sharing the word. And some of you will know this story very well. I'm sure all of you do. This is the story of Jesus in the temple. And sort of here's how the story goes, that they were in Jerusalem for a big party with a bunch of other families, right? And they were in this big wagon train, and they started going home. And about a day and a half into the trip, Joseph said, hey, where's Jesus? And Mary said, I don't know. I thought he was with you. And Joseph said, I thought he was with you. And it was a complete home alone moment. Kevin! You know, and they screamed. And then they ran as fast as they could and got a camel and went back to town and searched everywhere for their son. Now, how many of you are parents in this room? Okay, how many of you have ever lost your kid, right? Okay, yeah, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Doesn't matter where it is or how it happened, it's terrifying. And so I, I have to be honest, I lost my Evelyn one time at a party, and it was actually a party at my house. And we had about 15 adults and about, I don't know, 400 children, it felt like that. Anyway, but as some of you know, when you have a party sometimes, you just imagine that there's at least going to be one adult somewhere taking care of the children, but there really never is. It's just like the, the kids are off on their own, and I hadn't seen Evie for a really long time, and I'm like, where is my child? Where is Evie? And I start freaking out, realizing I cannot find my daughter. She was two at the time. So I'm running all through the house, and I'm running outside, and I ran in the yard, and I ran to the driveway, and the driveway gate was open. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's dead, you know, like, because that's where you go as a parent. You never think they're playing with the flowers in the front yard. It's either flowers or dead, you know. Um, so I'm imagining all of the worst, and we're running around, and I'm sobbing at this point, and people are trying to console me, and I'm freaking out. And I hear somebody say, I found her. She's right here. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Okay. And I ran to get her. And they said, she's right there. And there was my daughter underneath the kitchen table drinking a bottle of Mike's lemonade. <laughs> the blessed mother understands. It was my consolation. Is like, okay. <laughs> I'm such a good mother. And my daughter just looks at me. Hey, Mom. No, I don't. <laughs> I bet it was terrifying, you know, and that's how Mary must have felt. So she and Joseph, imagine them running all over town trying to find Jesus. And finally they go into this temple, and there he is. And there he is. And guess what he's doing? The word made flesh is speaking the word. The word of God is speaking the word of God in front of all these older men, 
all these learned scholars, all these people who had spent their lives studying God's word. And there was the word among them, teaching them, right? In the day when there was no social media, you can imagine all of these guys went home and said, I just heard the most extraordinary things. I just heard about love. I just heard about mercy. I just heard about why we shouldn't always follow the letter of the law to a T. This kid, oh my gosh. And so Mary, there she is running in, running in and hugging him and embracing him, crying probably, sobbing, Jesus, where have you been? We couldn't find you. I was so worried. And Jesus says this to her. He says, woman, what? Have you ever called your mama woman? So that's what Jesus says to her. He says, woman. <sighs> Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Speaking his word. And it's at this point the men say to Mary and Joseph, they say, we want you to know your son is incredible. He's so insightful. His answers have such clarity and such depth. He understands God at a level most 12-year-olds do not understand God. We are so impressed. That is what they say to her. We are so impressed. Now, if you think that the book of Scripture is not a book of comedy, you are reading it wrong because the very next line in Scripture says this, but Mary was not impressed. <laughs> that is the next line of Scripture. In fact, as you can see in this, we can imagine it. There's the scribes, and they're also taken with him. And there's Mary holding Jesus and whispering, I'm going to kill you when we get home. You know that's what's happening. You know that's what's happening. Look at her. And Joseph is standing over. I'm like, dude, you're dead. I'm glad I'm not you. Like, totally, right? Because you do not diss the mama. And you don't call her woman. And... Again, with scripture and comedy, it says, and Jesus went home with them and lived obediently with them. You know he did because you don't even hear about him until he's 30. <laughs> it was a long time. It was a long time before you heard from that boy again, right? You don't diss the mama. <laughs> but that is the word. This is the word made flesh. Now, i I want to sing a song for you because I recognize from this story that Jesus had to be where he was. He had to be sharing the word of God. He was preparing the hearts of men. He was planting seeds. Those men would never forget what they heard. Just like the people in our churches, when they hear a beautiful song or a wonderful homily or the perfect scripture for their life, they won't forget what they heard. That's how the word impacts. The word impacts us. And it changes everything. So I just want to ask you, when you think about the way you share it in your ministry and in your life, even with your family, this is my challenge, with my teenagers, with my husband, who has not picked up his underwear off the floor for the 4,852nd consecutive day in a row, right? Okay. But I love him anyway. Is it more important for me to be right or for me to be gracious? Is it more important for me to wound someone or to be a healer and say something that's filled with mercy? Do I have to comment? Do I have to comment? Or can I just write it up and then delete it? Because I probably need to say it, but I know better. These are the kinds of things we have to think about because every Sunday, we do this extraordinary thing. We take the Eucharist. And as we believe and know, the Eucharist is not just the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the word of God. So if we take in the word of God, we are called to share that same word. So if we go out of that church and we say, did you see that girl in her tight pants? Well, there goes the Eucharist. Or this is my favorite at my church. It's like everybody races to get out of the parking lot. It looks like the Indy 500 after church. Like, I got to get out of here. Like, I don't understand it. But that's not living the word. Living the word is knowing that we have the Eucharist, the very word made flesh dwelling in our flesh. And being careful about what we say.
and choosing to live the word of God with our love before we use our words. Amen. So back to that election story. I wondered if you guys would let me play you a song. Is that okay? So I wrote a song um, in November, right around the election, because I felt it was necessary. And I know that it will never be sung in church, but I can sing it for you because I think it encompasses what Jesus wanted us to do with the word. So if I could have your help, I would love for you to snap along. Would you? Okay. I'm going to show you how. All right. Great. I can do it. Oh, sorry. There it is. I got it. The song is called Be Nice. Be nice. And pass it along. Let the world hear the song you sing with your smile. Oh, be nice. Damn it. Be kind. And don't hold it back. As a matter of fact, you get what you give. So be kind. Don't be a bully, uncouth or unruly. The world has enough of that. Why do we need is someone well-mannered and winsome? And you're just the people for that. So be love. There is never enough. Go ahead, wear your heart on your sleeve. Let them see. Oh, oh, be love. pernicious or toxic there's plenty to go around you're someone sincerely delightful and clearly the most lovely people I've found so be nice that's just who we are I hope and when it's there in your heart you can't help yourself and you surely can do nothing else and be you with your sugar and spice. Oh, so please, before you have to be right, or before you press comment, or before you say that thing you want to say really bad to your mother-in-law, just don't. Trust me. But instead, be what? Oh, yes, be nice. Jesus himself was pretty nice, except for that incident in the temple. But you'll never be sorry if you're nice. <laughs> so I just have a few minutes left with you. So I, I really want to do this exercise. Um, instead, we're not going to get to a question because I have to dismiss you at 515. Darn it, and I'm a talker. Have you all had fun? Okay, I'm so glad. Um, I am available to do this. This is what I do for a living across the country. Um, so parish missions, women's events, youth events. Canada. Oh, Canada. Yes. Did you say Canada? Um, yeah, anything. Like bat mitzvahs, whatever. I'll be there. So, um, and, and here is my, uh, my great way to leave you. I, I want to leave you with prayer because I love prayer and um, I, I really believe that the worst thing we can tell someone is when they're really in a bad situation the worst thing we can say is I'm praying for you and I'm sorry because like that's all I can do I feel so helpless like that's all I can do that's the worst thing to say because if we believe that prayer works then prayer is absolutely everything we can do everything we can do for that person right if we believe that prayer works and we know we have a God who hears so everybody turn to someone and say I am praying for you because you really need it. Right? Yes. We are praying for one another. So I want to talk to you just really quickly about this. Because this is um, my favorite prayer in the whole wide world. 
And we pray it every Sunday at Mass, every single Sunday. And I know for those of us um, who have been Catholic a really long time, sometimes this prayer loses its luster. And especially if you're a liturgical musician, this is your thing. Like, you're praying the Our Father, and you're going, oh, my God, that number is the communion. I can't find it. You know, like, so you totally miss the Our Father. Um, <laughs> I call those a near-faith experience. Like, you're around it, but you're not, it's not happening to you. Okay. Um, and that's sometimes how this prayer is because it's sort of a passing point for us. It's kind of, you know, um, when the kids start screaming because everything's real quiet. And so um, we miss a lot of this. And I, what, all I'm going to say about it today is this. I love working with young people. And what I love about this prayer is that it came from the heart of a young person. How is that? A young person was brave enough to approach Jesus while he was teaching thousands of people. And he was brave enough, because I think the young are often brave in ways that we are not. He was brave enough to say this, to admit this and say, So, teacher, I don't know how to pray. Will you teach me? Will you teach me how to pray? And Jesus being Jesus, of course, knew that it wasn't just that young man, but perhaps hundreds of people. Because if you can understand this, at the time, most of the people who came to hear Jesus were illiterate. They didn't read. They heard. They listened. And their histories were oral histories. And the way they learned was through teaching and telling, not through reading. So this is what Jesus said to this young man. He said this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he started saying, praise God. Give him your praise. Tell God that he's holy. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge his holiness. And then supplication to say, give me today what I need, right? Just give me today what I need. And then forgive me. And he says, and ask God to lead you. I sometimes hate that we say it in church like, and lead us not into temptation, because I want it to say, and lead us, lead us, because that's the point Jesus was trying to make. Let God lead you. And of course, not into temptation, but away from the things that are evil. And when we pray it in church on Sunday, it sounds like this to me Our Father who art in heaven, we're holding hands. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Please don't let the person next to me have cooties. This is how we pray this prayer, right? And instead, We should be grabbing that hand, thankful for that person, not worried about whatever gross thing they're carrying on their hand. There's always Purell people. There's Purell, okay. But holding them and, and transmitting the love of God through this beautiful word direct from the mouth of the Savior to us. The words we speak is the word of Christ. It's the prayer of Jesus. Come on, that's huge. So what I'd like for you to do is everybody stand up. If you are far away from people, come into the middle, and I want you to grab hands with people beside you. Yep, grab their hands. Just reach in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There you go. Looking good. Don't be afraid. Just grab that sweaty, sweaty hand. Yep. All right. And we're going to sing and pray this Our Father. And as we pray it today, my prayer for you is that it will wash over your heart and your mind in a new way that you would remember this is not just you saying this. These are the very words that Jesus himself spoke. This is the word from word from word. The word of God, I am who am. The word of Christ, who became flesh, speaking the words of this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. 
forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil hold on to that hand and let's pray together god we thank you lord you are holy your name is holy god please lord your will be done not ours in the words of merton Make my will your own. And make your will my own. Give me today, God, what I need. What do I need today? Who needs your help today? We pray for those people. Think of them in your mind and in your heart. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us because we don't ask enough. So please do forgive us and help us to forgive because it is the hardest thing to do. Above all, Lord God, we are thankful. Thankful that we live in a country where we can freely gather to learn about you, to worship you, to sing about you in freedom and in peace. Help us not to take that for granted. Let us not take your beautiful, holy, precious word of the scripture for granted. That word that is so beautifully sung and spoken each week. Help us not just to hear it with our ears, but to listen with our hearts, to believe it with our being. Thank you, God. We love you so much. We love you so truly. Let us sing to our Father again. And as you sing it, that hand of the person you're holding, whoever they are, whether you know them or not, pray for them. Let this prayer be transmitted to them, this love of God. Let it flow through us into one another, into this body. We are not one, we are a body. We sing again. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and for sing Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you.